Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you for this very interesting, I hope, session on the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program. We will start with a short video, and then it will be my pleasure to hand over to two of our fellows who are going to share experience with us on PPPs in their respective countries. Thereafter, we'll have a discussion with my colleagues here whom I will introduce later on. So let's, let's start with the video, and then I will hand over directly to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Marie Lamfrando. I'm the CEO of the Global Infrastructure Hub, and I'm delighted to introduce this session today. I'd like to take a moment to briefly introduce the Global Infrastructure Hub. The GI Hub is the G20's dedicated infrastructure entity. We support the G20 to join an ambitious agenda on sustainable, resilient, and inclusive infrastructure. From our offices in Sydney, Australia, and Toronto, Canada, our team provides data, insights, and best practices to support decision makers, policy makers, and practitioners. We also work to create partnerships and collaboration across the industry and the public and the private sectors. We've workshops and initiatives like the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program. So today we'll be discussing how to improve the development and financing of public infrastructure in Africa. And this is an important question to address as we consider that Africa's unmet infrastructure need is estimated at nearly 3 trillion by 2040. The challenge of planning, procuring, financing and delivering infrastructure in Africa is not one that governments can meet alone. And capacity building is crucial to driving investment to help close Africa's infrastructure gap. And you can see this in action through initiatives like the IFP. This program was designed to upskill African government infrastructure specialists, enabling them to facilitate investment in a pipeline of new sustainable infrastructure that has positive social and economic impacts on African countries. The program is unique in that it links the private and public sectors in African infrastructure procurement and delivery with the participation of practitioners, lawyers, infrastructure specialists, and multilateral development banks. The Global Infrastructure Hub is pleased to be a key partner of the AIFP, and I'm confident the graduates of this program will be influential in improving public infrastructure in Africa for decades to come. And when it comes to improving the development of public infrastructure in Africa, we are faced with the challenge that today we want to deliver more infrastructure of increasing quality, scale and complexity, but faster and with less resources. If we want to close the infrastructure gap, we need to improve how we deliver infrastructure to ensure every dollar goes further. Many of the challenges faced in delivering infrastructure can be traced back to the project planning and preparation, the delivery model selection, assessment of risks, and funding and financing options. To assist governments with choosing the best delivery model, GI Hub has developed a new initiative that showcases proven improvements to the infrastructure delivery process at each stage of investment decision process. Students of the AIFP program will be one of the first to explore this initiative through the program's curriculum this year, and will be able to apply their knowledge in risk allocation negotiation. The discussion will highlight as well some of the challenges in Africa in funding and financing infrastructure, the role of multilateral development banks, and some of the innovative solutions to attract private capital in infrastructure. So thank you again for this opportunity to provide this introduction, and I wish you all a productive discussion. Thank you. So I think it's your... Good afternoon, Sorry. all. Uh, my name... So now we'll, we'll take a minute or two, or even five, to listen to our fellows will tell us from two very different countries what their experiences are, what are the pain points, and then we'll rebound on that uh, together with my, my fellow panelists. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a real privilege for me to be here with you 
and to address you on the situation analysis on, of the infrastructure uh, sector in my country, which is Mali. My name is Mariam Sisoko, and I work as financial uh, expert at the PPP unit of Mali. Now, to start this uh, very brief five minutes <laughs> um, uh, interaction, um, just and for those maybe who may not know um, very well my country, it's a very large country, 1.2 million square kilometers, landlocked. Uh, with uh, bordering seven other countries, no access to sea. And it's part of uh, several regional groupings, and this factor is very important, especially because of the landlocked uh, aspect of a country, like the West Africa Economic and Monetary Union, ECOWAS, and the G5 uh, Sahel countries. Now, since 2012, Mali has been engulfed in a deep multidimensional crisis compounded by terrorist attacks against civilian and military. And to restore the stability and security in the country, national efforts are being supported by close to 20,000 foreign troops from the United Nations, from France, and from the over four G5 style countries, all facing the scourge of violent extremism and terrorism. Despite this difficult uh, context, the country has shown quite a, a good level of resilience with the economy uh, growing at a rate of about 5% per year, except in 2012, where we are witnessing a slowdown in the economy due, of course, to the COVID uh, pandemic, which has affected all countries, but also to the uh, political crisis, political and social crisis in the country. There was a coup d'etat in uh, 2020 and 2021, again, um, and the same uh, kind of political uh, um, instability in the country. Now, in terms of infrastructure needs, um, the focus is very much national but with a regional perspective. And uh, the overarching development uh, framework for Mali for 2019 uh, to 2023 uh, put the emphasis on four uh, different uh, sectors or type of infrastructure. First, the energy. Uh, infrastructure and energy to support over um, uh, productive sectors. Uh, with the provision of uh, affordable and quality energy uh, to, to help these uh, over sectors. Um, this energy is supplied either locally or regionally from uh, fossil, hydro, and renewable sources. Second sector, transport infrastructure. Um, with the construction of, uh, of roads, bridge, bridges, uh, dry land, dry, dry port uh, linking to a regional seaport, uh, Dakar, Abidjan, etc., uh, to facilitate the opening up of the country, opening not only internally but also opening externally, uh, you know, to uh, towards the uh, the main international um, road. Uh, Trans, uh, economic road. Uh, construction of um, waterways as well, uh, because the country has uh, two main rivers uh, uh, which can allow for some um, uh, transportation as well. And the rehabilitation of the Dakar Bamako Railroad. This is a, a key uh, infrastructure which we will certainly hear a lot about in the coming uh, years. It's a process that has started with the assistance of the World Bank. Infrastructure for value chain creation, especially in the agricultural sector. 80% of uh, the population is occupied with agriculture. So this is a, a key sector in the, for the country but also the creation of special uh, economic zones. Or, for example, uh, the one which is now being contemplated uh, between Mali, Burkina Faso, and Cote d'Ivoire. 
infrastructure for the development of the human capital in terms of health, education, uh, water and sanitation, and especially urban sanitation. The capital city of Mali is uh, uh, witnessing a exponential growth in terms of uh, uh, population, but the infrastructure is lacking behind. Now, PPP has an approach to fill the infrastructure gap. Uh, Mali has uh, uh, developed a, a PPP framework and a PPP law in 2017. So it's, it's fairly new. It's fairly new. Uh, of course, before, there were uh, over approaches to, to PPP, mostly concession type uh, of, uh, of uh, PPPs. And the key objectives of the country with this PPP uh, program is to alleviate the deficit in infrastructure and also to make sure that these infrastructure are of a, a, a good quality and are sustainable. Um, so we this through the, uh, the, the up, uh, input of the private sector. So despite the difficult uh, circumstances in the country I just mentioned earlier, it's, it, there is a good interest from the private sector worldwide uh, to enter into PPP contracts in, in Mali. Um, the, 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 the PPP uh, aspect is really dominated by unsolicited, unsolicited offers with uh, direct agreement, uh, which are the exceptions in the law, in the PPP law but are the most more frequent type of uh, contractualization that we see because the, 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 and the norm set by the law is a public tendering. Uh, now, um, I work for the PPP unit and in the course of uh, about 18, the last 18 months uh, where we have uh, uh, reviewed project, our role is not to initiate PPP project. This is left to the contracting authorities like the ministries or the decentralized entities like uh, collectivity territorial. Uh, but in the course, uh, in our uh, function, we have to review this project at certain key stage, uh, at the end of the identification phase, at the appraisal phase, before a PP contract is signed and also throughout the implementation of the project. So this is a, the key task that we do at the PPP unit. And in the course of the eight, past 18 months, we have seen that uh, the energy sector really dominates clearly uh, among the projects that are uh, following, uh, being developed uh, as, as PPPs. In um, a portfolio or uh, uh, potential PPP project, about 38 PPP uh, projects that, that could be developed in, in, uh, as, a, as PPPs, 14 pertain to the energy sector, six to agriculture, and five to transport. So really a, a key dominance of the elect, uh, energy sector because it's really key in the development process of a country. Now, what are some of the lessons we have learned uh, through this uh, period uh, since the, uh, the setting up of the PPP unit in 2017? Is that the PPP project is a very cost complex one and it's a costly one as well. And the PPP law doesn't really discriminate uh, among projects. Either the project is uh, 50 million euros or 5 million the projects have to still go through the same due diligence process, uh, irrespective of the size. And this creates a level of inefficiency. Now, uh, there could, there, it's anticipated that there will be a review of the law to kind of bring a little bit of flexibility in line with um, the PPP directives that the West African Economic and Monetary Union is uh, in the process of preparing. And it's planned in, under this directive that there will be some discrimination according to the level and the size of the project. Second lesson learned. There is a need for contracting authorities, the ministries, the sectoral ministries, uh, the, the uh, decentralized entities, 
to spend more time in the, in the identification and uh, prioritization and planning phase of a project. Because if you start wrong, this is the initial phase of a PPP process. And if this phase uh, is not properly done for whatever reason, it would be very difficult to try to, uh, um, to cover, in a way, some of the, the, the insufficiencies that could already be detected at this early stage and that could probably lead to the decision to not go uh, through the PPP route, but perhaps for just a normal procure, public procurement. This is necessary, in my view, to ensure that the PPP project really bring value for money to the country and value for people as well. Now, um, another issue that uh, we have been noticing is that the contracting authorities should ensure that the terms of PPP contract are fair and balanced especially when it comes to some issues like force majeure and termination, compensation, compensation for termination uh, clauses. Uh, these are really critical. Uh, we have seen, especially in some unsolicited uh, project, uh, everything, almost everything put under political force majeure. But this is a way for the private sector to push back, actually, the risk. Uh, but the PPP says it, there has to be an equilibrium. Uh, the, the entity that is the best suited to, to bear certain risk should bear this risk. But it's not that because of the complex political situation of Mali that all type of risk should go uh, to, 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 the, to the side of the government, especially when they are not necessarily, uh, they would not necessarily qualify as political force majeure. Uh, first, third issue, the PPP process is really, uh, has really to be embedded in the work practice of the contracting authorities, and this is not the case yet. There is a lot of uh, understanding uh, to, to still, or uh, understanding, yes, to begin uh, uh, by the, the, um, the public sector in the PPP process, and this might take a little bit of time. But the cons consequences of the fact that there is not yet a good understanding of a process is that there, there is an imbalance in terms of knowledge and experience between public partner and private partner. And of course, this imbalance is not always in favor of the pub, uh, public side. Um, so capacity building is a key word, I think, in, in the case of Mali and probably in the case of uh, other countries represented in this program. And that's why I, I would uh, really want to thank all those who have permitted us from several countries to come to, to this training here. And in order for us to gain additional knowledge and to be at par, uh, hopefully at par or close to the uh, public, uh, the private partners who come very well prepared uh, when they are dealing with uh, countries such as ours. I would like to stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I think you started with a very wise uh, statement about the situation that we would like to hear from Kenya now. Uh, a very good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Gide Magara. I work for the Public Private Partnerships Directorate of the National Treasury, Kenya. Uh, and it's a great privilege and honor to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, very quickly, just like what Mariam has stated, um, I'd like to belabor a few things uh, within the context of the theme today. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the experiences in Kenya in particular, but I'm going to sum it up and I'm going to relate that to what Mariam has especially spoke to, the challenges and the nuances that are in Africa, particularly about preparation and about those things that are needed to adequately prepare uh, infrastructure PPP projects. Very quick, um, 
Kenya is um, one of the countries in the sub-Saharan Africa with a population of 51 million people. And just recently we had a review of our Public-Private Partnerships Act, and it was a felt need, but it was also a matter of necessity because like many countries, Kenya was also plunged into the crisis of COVID-19. And therefore, there was an initiative by the government to redirect some of those finances towards alleviating the scourge of COVID-19. But um, in the context of doing that, um, the country has, for the last two years, been faced by infrastructure deficit of about three to four billion uh, US dollars. And th those figures are, are quite stacking. And therefore, there is a need to fill in that infrastructure need. And especially uh, right now, uh, where the government of Kenya is highly dependent on PPPs. Yes, we have active PPP projects within our space. In 2013, we had about 80 projects. And in 2020, the PPP directorate decided to reprioritize those projects and have high impact focus projects that were aligned to the national priority list. So right now we have 31 uh, projects that cut across different sectors within transport, uh, within the uh, water sector, and also within uh, the roads and bridges sector. Some of the experiences that I've experienced firsthand, and I share this sentiment with Mariam, is lack of proper preparation. But what exactly is the challenge behind lack of proper preparation? I would say the challenge could be said, in my view, is a challenge of, as one leader in Africa, Mr. Patrick Awo, the founder of Osesh University, put it, it's a problem of leadership. And the leadership that I'm talking about is a kind of leadership that is technocratic. So what is needed in Africa is proper technocrats with the requisite skills to understand how to prepare projects and not in abstract in real life. So the message I'm trying to put across here is that we need homegrown solutions to some of these challenges, but we need a point of departure where there is a great opportunity for young African technocrat leaders and civil servants like us to come and learn. Let me say, the Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program has accorded that opportunity. And I'm especially privileged and honored for the Africa Infrastructure Pro uh, uh, Program for that opportunity to come and learn, identify those solutions, and go back to Africa and, and, and come up with the right solutions. Uh, earlier today, we had a session, and I had uh, uh, Mr. Gregory Ness talk about preparation. Uh, Gregory Ness from Standard Chartered Bank, he also spoke heavily on some of the emerging issues like ESG. And I can tell you for a fact that some of these emerging issues are not quite uh, relevant to the African leaders because of something that I will talk about and it's called political expediency. And we have leaders in the political scheme who would want to have very good PPP projects, but they would want projects that are prepared within two or three weeks. It's impossible, I dare submit. So we need the kind of leadership, the technocrat leadership that will speak to the political leaders and they would be hard and tell them how to properly do projects. I need to end there, but before I end there, um, I'd like to especially thank uh, the Meridium Global Infrastructure Hub, uh, together with World Economic Forum for organizing this Africa Infrastructure Fellowship Program. I carry with me, uh, on my behalf and on behalf of my colleague, Hilda Carrier, the profound gratitude of Kenya National Treasury for this uh, Infrastructure Week, and I look forward to more interaction with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Karibu, you're welcome. It's a very nice uh, program and we are very uh, proud ourselves to be contributors. And I'm sure that what you said today will be echoed during the whole uh, training because what you say is exactly, I think, what is the target of, of this program. So it's a, it's a very good start. Let me introduce Usman first, Usman Diarawara. Is, uh, has been working for more than 12 years on the infrastructure space, and he has a dedicated focus on the African continent. He's currently working with EY as part of the infrastructure advisory team, and he's based in Paris. He advises public authorities and private partners on the full life cycle on their infrastructure projects. And of course, he is a seasoned professional on the PPP space. 
I also have the pleasure to have with me Hugues de la Forge. Hugues has also a great experience in the field. He has recently co-founded Junction, which is a network of lawyers and experts dedicated to the EMEA area for projects and arbitration. And Hugues has been a partner at FIDAL recently. He was heading the Africa Group over four years. And before that, he had a very interesting professional experience. We can say he's a multi -sector, he has a multi-sector expertise sorry, in major infrastructure and construction projects in France and abroad, but especially in Africa. And Hugues has also a, a great deal of experience in complex structuring of PPPs. So I think we have the right people with me. I'm Hassina P. I'm very delighted to be here with you. I was heading the export finance business of Société Générale over the past six years, and now I'm in charge of impact-based finance. I've been working a lot of infrastructure in Africa with a lot of pleasure. We've been financing many roads and bridges and hospitals, water and sanitation, monorails and a lot of different transport infrastructure. But I have to say for all of these projects, we have had the full recourse on the sovereign. People have told us a lot about a so-called funding gap for the SDGs, especially in Africa. But I can tell you that there is a lot of liquidity. And if we find the right projects, we will fund them. So I don't see any funding gap. I have experienced a gap in bankable projects. And I think that's why we are here today. And I hope that um, when I, I turn back to my beloved export finance business, my colleagues will tell me in a few years' time that now they go and do uh, PPPs. And we do have in the pipe with certain of your countries some potential transactions. So I think it's very exciting because the need for infrastructure is going to grow. We've seen that, especially in the recent years. The possibility to finance everything on budget will be limited, of course, it's normal, and so it's time for PPP to take off. Yeah? So you've said a lot of very interesting things. I'm not going to repeat. What I had noted is, uh, well, uh, costly and complex, even for some small projects. How to select uh, projects that are suitable for PPP. Beware of contractual terms and compensation clauses, of course. Capacity building is the thing that everybody wants to make sure it's rightly done. Um, and of course, you want to learn a lot to be at par in terms of knowledge uh, between the public and the private side. I would be very interesting to hear uh, from Hug and Usman what they think about that, about the pain points, what they think of the uh, program could do on that and, and share your experience, if you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hasina. And thanks again, Europlace Organization and IFP for inviting me to this very important conference. So I'm, I'm delighted to see the new IFP class and some um, familiar faces with, I, uh, with whom I worked before. Uh, so I also thank you for your very interesting uh, um, contribution speeches, uh, introductory speech, which uh, indeed um, brain brought a lot to, to the debate because I think you summarized most of the difficulties but also the challenge you face in PPP project. And as Ina is right, we talk a lot about PPPs, PPPs low, PPP project, but the reality is that there are few projects, at least in Francophone Africa, the one I know, which are really taking off. So in my experience, I try to be as brief as possible. I think there are four conditions that need to be met for uh, projects or PPP, whatever PPP, and at the broad uh, meaning of it, uh, succeed. First, I think the country must have a vision uh, and strategy. And it's not sufficient for a country to have some natural resources, to have oil. Um, let's take the example of Dubai. Uh, without a vision of a shared Dubai, it would not be the, the Dubai we know as of today, and only three decades. I take the example of Morocco, of course, which is a different country, but uh, anyway, with this limited resource, the Kingdom of Morocco, with the new king, Mohammed VI, uh, 20 years ago, managed to uh, launch a set of um, industrial and um, um, uh, successful strategic plans regarding automotive, renewables, energy, industrial developments. 
and, and I think it's topic on the project I worked with, uh, worked on, on the uh, high speed train between Tangier and Casablanca, that almost the uh, multilaterals and the lenders were lining up to finance this project. I think the second point is linked to the first one. It has been mentioned by, by, by some of you. It, the maturity in the institutional and regularity framework. We do not necessarily need in Africa a um, democratic system as we perceive it from Western standards. And we do not necessarily need a strong man. Uh, but I think you need, we need someone in each country which is likely and capable of setting up some a pack of reforms. Of course, this needs to be balanced with certain limits to avoid abuse of power and, and limited uh, numbers of successive stem. But I think that's another key issue. To narrow down a little bit, and it's more lawyer things, more, was more political approach, um, I think uh, there is a minimum of reforms you need to have unless uh, the usual suspects, lenders, investors, contractors, operators won't come. I just take two examples, uh, arbitration, my colleague Sally knows much more than I, but um, if the country is not a signatory to the New York Convention, which requires, you know, which pr provides for the enforcement of the awards, I think that's a very difficult, difficult to attract investors in that case, and also uh, international uh, players. They also need to have um, a couple of usual provisions. You mentioned force majeure termination, security package, sureties and asset, and a couple of compensation pr provisions. I don't think pushing back compensation to the state or the public part is a good idea. Uh, obviously, uh, risks should be allocated to the party, uh, as uh, I will probably repeat it several times when I will have the chance to have you uh, during the courses. So the, the, the party which is more likely and capable to uh, bear it. However, we know in certain countries it's useless to do so because the state won't have any chance to um, uh, abide with these compensations. So you have to be innovative. You have to cover your risk which doesn't necessarily mean to double the price, but we all have to be aware of that. I mean, if an investor needs to have an IRR of 20%, we all know it will cost almost double of the price. So um, it means also that the state, the public part, should make some house cleaning before asking impossible things to the investors, to the private part. And the first of the thing is to pay, to pay the consultants, to pay what he has to pay. And this credit rating, I mean, this reliability is a key issue for a lot, not only for lawyers, but for a lot of contractors and a lot of uh, investors. Um, and I, fully, I won't be too long, but I also fully agree on what you say. Uh, I think uh, the set of laws as we know it, the PPP laws, PFI, which have been quite a success in Europe or Western countries, does not necessarily match with African countries. You definitely need some flexibility. You need some model B, model plan B, plan C. Of course, I mean, you were right to remind that, that most of the projects are unsolicited bit because this is the reality. It's already very difficult to tackle a project in Africa. Plus, if you have to go through all the difficulties of uh, the PPP uh, process system, and I know very well some of them, it's even more difficult. So um, I think we should not ask for uh, more than uh, the, Amer the African uh, country can shoe. I think we need to have a, um, a level of balance in that respect. And finally, of, of course, um, I think that's why we are all here for a level of um, the PPP. Uh, require a level of preparation. I think it has been mentioned at length, so I will not uh, elaborate too much on that, but I think financing is not everything, and I fully agree with Asina. Uh, we do need the, the lenders, the sponsors, as we say, in our own uh, slang, is that a minimum level of preparation uh, of, the, of the project. So if there is not feasibility study or better preliminary, stu preliminary study, it's quite difficult to, for certain uh, investors to, um, 
to, to, to go forward, to look forward. And finally, education, of course, and capacity building uh, is a key factor. And your massive presence here today confirms it. I've personally the chance to train a lot of uh, classes in different uh, organization and framework. And it's a very, um, it's a bless to all of you all here today and hope, hopefully help each other to interact and erase uh, the boundaries in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Usman, would you like to, to share with us as well? Yeah, thank you, Asina. Thank you all for, for your statements. I think I, I can sum it with uh, a new definition of uh, PPP. Uh, I've heard plan, I've heard prepare, I, I've heard procure. I think uh, these early stages uh, through uh, the life cycle of an infrastructure project is really key. And I also heard something from, uh, from Mary. Uh, she didn't mention a financing gap. She mentioned an unmet infrastructure need in Africa. And I think it's the right term. We don't, there is no lack of liquidity and uh, of, uh, of uh, funding uh, to, to finance and to develop these uh, projects across the continent. Uh, we have a lack of uh, project uh, of, uh, of well-prepared projects. And I think, uh, um, irrespectively of the delivery model, uh, you can have a public procurement or a PPP uh, to set up an infrastructure project. Even using a public procurement method, uh, you need a project to be well-prepared uh, to have um, a, a, a proper design, uh, to launch a proper tender, uh, to have uh, comparable bids. Uh, developing a PPP uh, he, uh, is adding an additional uh, layer of complexity because the contractual framework to, be, to put in place is more complex than uh, than uh, public uh, uh, public contracts, and uh, the various uh, public authorities, the various contracting authorities, are not uh, well prepared to to uh, to, um, to to uh, yes to procure such uh, complex contracts. It's because it's uh, f quite new uh, in these various countries. Uh, you mentioned a law or, uh, 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 in place uh, from 2017 uh, in Mali. Uh, I heard uh, it was in 20, uh, 11, uh, 2011 in, uh, in Kenya. And in fact, very few contracting authorities had a chance to experiment uh, this quite due uh, form of procurement across the continent. I agree with <laughs> with Hugh, sorry, uh, to say that we have seen, in fact, quite few uh, infrastructure projects developed in PPPs across the continent, even if uh, you have discrepancies between uh, the various countries. Uh, but when you, you mentioned um, Morocco, uh, you mentioned, uh, for instance, in Morocco, even if uh, they have a law for uh, 2014, I think, uh, they have not carried out any project uh, under PPP. And uh, you have other, uh, pr many other countries where you have uh, a law in place, you have a PPP unit in place, but you, there is lack of uh, funding to have uh, projects well prepared. Uh, and um, Hugues mentioned that, uh, yes, uh, even in France, in, even in developed countries, uh, contracting authorities uh, hired some some external external parties uh, to help them to prepare these projects. Uh, it's really key to have uh, the right people in the right place to help the various contracting authorities to 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 prepare uh, these infrastructure projects. And it, there is a need uh, of, uh, of financing uh, to to have a well prepared project. So, um, and in addition, when we talk about uh, 
um, how to finance uh, public infrastructure. Uh, we um, often say that uh, PPP can be a solution, but we need to keep in mind that PPP will not uh, modify the economic model uh, underlying a given infrastructure project. Uh, you have to assess your infrastructure project irrespectively uh, the, 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 the infrastructure delivery model to analyze the economy, the, not only the social economic impact of a, a, a given project, but also the impact on the budget of the country or the impact of the, in, in the budget of the decentralized uh, entity or national entity. So what, what uh, I want you to, to keep in mind is that um, developing infrastructure projects uh, 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 to develop uh, infrastructure projects, you need to, to fairly and correctly assess what will be the, the impact on budget and by then uh, work on the best solution, the best delivery model to, uh, to, to put in place a project. And for some projects, perhaps uh, PPP is not the right solution and the public procurement can be uh, the, the, the smoothest way, way or the easiest way to, 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 uh, to put in place uh, a given project. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, PPP can have a positive impact, especially for projects uh, which are uh, not uh, on the core business of these various contracting authorities. And for projects with innovation uh, where the, the, the capacities of the private sector is needed, uh, I think there is an interest to, to, uh, to put in place uh, some PPPs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know, Victoria, if you're the timekeeper, and I have to tell you I have no clue about when we started and when we need to stop. So at some point you will tell me, OK? Um, I, I would just like to share something with you. Thank you very much for what you said. Uh, I think it's very consistent with what we heard, and, and you're very complimentary in the way you see it. I would like to add a little seed in your brains. And you will have, um, when you come to the bank, you will have the uh, uh, well, with my colleagues, a whole session about impact, impact-based finance. I know that here we're saying that we need to be quite clear on the RFPs, if there is RFP, on the procurement process anyway, uh, clear about what we want, not to have any surprise. But on top of what we want, we need always to think about how to maximize impacts. Because you said that PPPs have to be to bring value for money, and they need to bring value for people. And I think it's, it's very important. And in reality, if, if I think about the social infrastructure, um, you, could, you could ask whether you need a, a university building with such size or whether you need access to education everywhere in the country. Whether you need uh, this beautiful land, uh, you know, uh, flagship hospital in the capital city or whether you need access to education everywhere in the country. It's not the same. Because maybe if you ask people to bring a bit more impact, they will put the flagship hospital, but then they will make some connections with the digital, which allows a lot of things today. And maybe you will get much more impact for an additional investment that is not that big. So I think today, each of us need always to think how to maximize impact. And here I'm talking the obvious, but it goes much further. If you bring electricity somewhere, it will, it will have impact on access to water with solar pumps. It will have impact to uh, sanitation because you will have fridges and vaccinations and so on and so forth. So it's an endless subject. So please have this seed in your brains that when you think about a procurement, a project, there will be for a small amount only of additional budget, the possibility to bring a lot of impact to your countries. So, I'm looking at Victoria now. Um, we said that this was an open round table. That means that any of us, any of you, is invited to share views. And then, uh, before we stop, we'll have another two testimonies, right? Okay. For the conclusion. 
So you're more than welcome uh, around the table if you would like to react to what has been said or to share experience or what, whatever is, is you're welcome. Yes. So I have a question. First, first uh, thank you for this uh, presentation, for this clarification about the, the PPP and the risk in Africa and how to address it. So I would like to ask, uh, how can we convince the, 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 the private investor to invest in our country with that uncertainty of risk? So how can we convince them about that? <laughs> That's, That's a good question. Uh, I think uh, through the, the various contractual uh, agreements to be put in place in a, an infrastructure project, even uh, even using a public procurement, the, there there is a security package to be put in place to ensure the bankability of a given project. So when you will uh, ask a, a banker to to give financing uh, for for a project. Uh, they will look at uh, the yes, and Mariam mentioned that uh, the, the the risk balance between the public and the private sector, and especially for uh, for uh, for countries with with no track record in infrastructure uh, in PPPs, uh, and it could be counterintuitive, but uh, the the level of required. Uh, securities and level of, uh, of required guarantees will be higher or much higher than for other uh, and for uh, developed countries. So um, you have to keep in mind that uh, we are talking about public infrastructures, so behind you have a public uh, demand, a, a political insight um, uh, and a public need for uh, these given infrastructures. So, um, you, uh, the, the, the governments have to, uh, to, to, to give some, uh, an, high, an high level of securities uh, to private investors to allow them to, uh, to develop such projects. It, and I know that sometimes when I, I am with my public clients and uh, we are talking about various clauses on these uh, various uh, project documents. Uh, some requirements can be seen as uh, not balanced, and uh, the level of requirements asked uh, for uh, to be given by the government or to be given by the public entity could be seen as uh, too high. Uh, but it's, at the moment, the only solution to uh, to, 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 to meet uh, the, 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 the risk, uh, yes, the, 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 to, to meet the, 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 the needs and the level of certainty required for banks to, to be able to finance projects. And you, you don't have to forget that for many of these PPPs, we are relying on the non-recourse finance uh, uh, structure. So it means that uh, for a lender, uh, you cannot rely on the balance sheet of the sponsor. So even if you have a very strong sponsor, uh, uh, they, they only have limited or no recourse to, to the sponsor. So the project itself needs to be self-sufficient and uh, to, to be, it needs to be, uh, it needs to, it needs to uh, to, um, to generate sufficient cash flow to, uh, to cover uh, the, the debt service. So uh, you, you have to ensure that in any case, whatever the situation is, uh, the, uh, the project will generate these cash flows to, uh, to ensure the debt service. And it, it, it means uh, giving uh, a certain level of guarantees uh, to, uh, to ensure this debt service. If I may, and you mentioned some um, project finance basis which are based on concession or BOT project, i.e. Uh, which underpin a certain uh, stream or flow of revenues. And those kind of projects like port projects or highway with a certain level of traffic, patronage, are 
quite easily uh, bankable because actually they rely on a very strong uh, financial case and base case. The problem lies more with the uh, social PPP and the payment, which pay, you know the difference, the payment who relies uh, mostly on the public part or either the sovereign part or the sub-sovereign part. So it's quite, it's already difficult with the sovereign part, so it's even more difficult with the sub-sovereign. In this case, I mean, I think, uh, as Ina mentioned, it, you definitely need some kind of sovereign support or enhanced support through uh, MIGA or, or, or like World Bank or um, Bank of Africa, develop, uh, African Development Bank, because there is no other way to uh, guarantee uh, the payment of uh, the repayment of the, the PPP in that case. So that's a very different structure. I, we put it in the same PPP uh, system, but that's very different. But I think before that, uh, I mentioned the, the level of maturity of institutional uh, and regularity framework, which I think is a key point. And also probably, the, of course, the level of the capacity buildings, but the diaspora in Africa countries has a very strong role to play. And I, I think what in the country I know most because I've been living there in Morocco, we see a quite uh, game changer when the king came back in 2000, came rise in 2000, 1990, sorry, and he called the diaspora who were raised, born, educated in Paris, London, wherever, to go back in this country. And because there was a level of confidence, yes, we come back because I know you will do something for, for the country and it's my time to do that. And I think that was a very uh, game changer amongst many other criteria. I don't want to be too long. Okay, so I think we should now uh, seek our last uh, speakers on the, the conclusion, then we'll say a very short last word. So who's, who's going to tell us about the conclusions? Thank you, Hasina. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. I'm Teopolina Namaje from Namibia the only country in Africa where the dunes meet the ocean. I wish I could show you the picture. So I'm very delighted to be here. And I'm excited to start off my Africa Infrastructure Fellowship with the attendance of, of the fifth edition of Paris Infra Week. Uh, Why are we talking about public infrastructure? Uh, I would love to share my motivation why I'm joining the program. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to share with you one of the aspiration of the Agenda 2063. Uh, this is our plan, or Africa plan, to transform the nation of Africa into powerful, innovative houses. So my favorite one is aspiration number six, which reads, an Africa whose development is people-driven relying on the potential offered by the African people, especially women and youth. So with my motivation, I'm here to learn. I'm here to grab everything from all of you. <laughs> and we're talking of our new baby on the continent, which is African continental free trade area. There is no way we could talk about this without talking about infrastructure development. We would like to connect Africa. Africa should be transconnected. I would love one day by 2063 or whenever to drive from Namibia, Gabon, Mali, all the roads infrastructure connected. So uh, I'm here to really learn I know the definition of PP is quite easy, public-private partnership, but what is the success behind it, really? And how do we select? I think Miriam have emphasized on that. Proper planning and proper selections of projects. I'm here to grab all this. I'm also here to understand different sides of PPP and uh, as far as uh, our countries are concerned, infrastructure development is really one of the biggest uh, challenges. Uh, funding, lack of funding, the, the 
funding gap is so huge. We need so much. Uh, I, I believe this is a time for the private sector to come in, but how is public sector, how do we convince the private sector as the question was raised earlier? So I'm here to learn, engage, and share a beautiful story from my continent. And on behalf of all the fellows, we thank all the organizers, the initiator of this amazing program. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Who's turn? Your... It's me again. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my name is Abdurrahim Elbah. I'm from uh, Mauritania. So uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer of the Paris uh, Infra Week. Uh, but above all, to highlight the Africa Infrastructure Program Initiative, sponsored by the Global Infrastructure Hub, Mary Jim, and the World Economic Forum. So this exceptional initiative allow us uh, from African state to access a practical training with enriching feedback to bring infrastructure project to fruition more effectively in our respective countries. So as you may be aware, uh, Africa's investment needs are enormous. Uh, the, the African Development Bank estimated them from 130 to 170 billion dollar a year. So and today they greatly exceed the sum due to new investment made necessary by the COVID-19 crisis. So I think this training will allow us to, 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 to gain more knowledge and more experience, especially from each other, because uh, we face in Africa the same difficulties, the same problem. So I think if one of us already uh, get to a, 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 a stage of PPP project, he can share his experience with us and help each other to, to, to gain uh, more, 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 more knowledge and to find better solution. So uh, uh, as you maybe know, PPP is a new concept in my country, Mauritania, and the PPP department is recently created there. So I think uh, uh, this program will have a positive impact on developing the sector in, in, in our country. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your enthusiasm. We're really uh, happy. I think you're right to say that we should uh, pay a tribute to the uh, people who initiated that program. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of people think about uh, nice ideas, but very few people uh, put them into practice uh, in such a magnitude and in such a professional way. We, uh, and I'm, I'm sure my partners will, will share the view, uh, I was really astonished by the program when I heard about it three, four years ago, and we immediately thought it was a good idea and we should try to help a little bit. So. But at the same time, I think that we need to congratulate you and your countries because you're doing a big investment, personally, and the country as well. And so I think that uh, you are going to have a big impact in the future. And altogether, uh, you are really building something. You're building history in a way. And I think it's, um, it's very good. And I like the way that, that you mentioned the fact that you're going to be a network you're going to build a pan-African network of professionals with an experience. And you will always be there for each other to share. And uh, we all know that when something is new like that, it's always tricky. And you know uh, you learn from experience. But if it's your own experience and you only have one or two projects, it's not at all the same scale than having 20, 50, because at some point you will be you know, a lot of people sharing and, and avoiding mistakes, because you will be sharing experience. I think this has no, no price. It's a huge value. So thank you very much. I think it's very exciting. We're very happy, uh, all of us, to, uh, to be here with you. And, uh, and welcome. Thank you. <laughs>